to get there. And I have to be honest, I, as a kid who grew up in Tacoma um, and joined the military hoping to see the world um, and then getting stationed right here at Fort Lewis, Washington, it was always my desire to travel um, and learn about other places and that never really happened to me as a child. Um, I had an opportunity when I was in high school, my stepfather was in the army and we spent a year in Germany and came right back to Tacoma. And that was about as most that was about the most international travel I ever did. As an adult, the furthest out of town I got internationally was Mexico for a few vacations. Um, and then to become native and to dive into this incredible program that we have in the city of Tacoma to understand why it's so important and why the relationships are so important. Um, I can't I was trying to figure out, I, I believe Kitakishu and Goonsum were our first trip, right? Yay, so that was, I was like, my memory is really bad. So I, I, I'm glad Debbie is sitting here to remind me. So uh, my first city sister trip was, a, we, we hit two cities, and that's how I've been able to do it, because I think the, the second trip, we hit two cities, and then we, the last trip, just before COVID, we got to go to George, South Africa. Um, but the first trip, and, that's, and it's great that we're, we're honoring the as the, as our first recognition, our longest sister city um, relationship, but my first trip was to Kitakishi. And, and while I thought things would be so incredibly different, and they were, I found that we have so much more in common than we have not in common. I found that cities across the world face the same issues that we face here in, this, in Tacoma. I found out that mayors want the exact same thing in their cities, no matter where they are, that I want right here in Tacoma. And I found the benefit of the friendship that we can have with all of our sister cities across the continent. The fact that we can learn from one another, can share with one another, whether that be through education, or through the arts, or through economics, I found that we, can, we are so much stronger together. And I say that, I said that a lot during the pandemic. Um, but that doesn't just apply to people who live in Tacoma. That really applies to all of our relationships across the world. It is befitting that we would start tonight with our oldest sister city, Kitakishu, Japan. Um, and and I, I really wish, I really wish if we were not in these times because of how great it would be to have the mayor of Kitakishu right here with us this evening. As you go through um, the, the exhibit, you'll get to see some of the things that I've actually got to collect as, as mayor. One of my fondest memories in Kitakishu was um, standing at the front when they were reopening the Kokor Castle. They had just done this huge remodeling of the Kokor and restoration of the castle. And I was standing up front as the only woman in line with about 20 other men, one being, do you remember, one was a movie, was a, was, was a, a Japanese movie star. And I got, to, I got to cut, and my scissors were actually here. I got special gold scissors to help cut the ribbon for the opening of the Kokora Castle. And I think about this little girl who grew up in Tacoma, Washington, who went to Lincoln High School and joined the military, all the way in Kitakishi, Japan, cutting a ribbon for the opening of a castle. And I think about what that did for me as an adult and how it opened up my eyes. And it made me even more committed to making sure that we deepen these relationships with our sister cities. And we get more of our young people out to understand the connection and why it's important to have these relationships. And what's so great about this program is that we don't always have to go there to have those connections. Since being mayor, I've entertained several people from our sister cities across the country. We've had, through our sister cities program, and I cannot thank Claire and all of the members of the sister cities programs for the work that you do. I want to especially thank Walter, so good to see you, Walter, in person, um, for leading the delegation to Kitakishu as the chairperson of our Kitakishu sister committee. But to all of you, and once we left Kitakishu, then we, we, we went with Oak Sun and we went over to Gunsan, Korea. Um, and had an incredible time in Gunsan. You will see the traditional handball that was given to me, um, that was made especially for me by the First Lady of Gunsan, Korea. Um, such an honor. I, I was at work one day and this fox showed up 
and I opened it, and she had it made for me, and it fit me perfectly. And I was thinking, at what point did I get measured for this? Because <laughs> I, I don't remember getting measured. The one I tried on there was, you know, let's let's be honest. Um, in the Asian culture, people tend to be a little bit smaller than us Americans. <laughs> and so when I put on the handball there, I thought, this is going to be interesting. And then when she sent me my own, I thought, if only it will fit. And it fit perfectly. Um, and then I got a chance not to just receive it, but then to wear it when they came to Tacoma, Washington to celebrate the 30th anniversary of our relationship with Goonsung. And so it, this program and what we're doing with our sister cities is so important. And I can't thank you all enough for supporting them. For, for supporting them. And I look forward um, to continuing all of these relationships, to potentially even growing our sister city committees. But that doesn't work without all of you. The city itself can't support all of this work on our own. And that's why, Sylvia, people like you who lead this work nationally, um, who have been engaged for the longest time are so important for us to continue these relationships and to grow these relationships. So if you're not on the sister city committee, please think about joining one. If you have a sister city that you are a city that you are in love with and think we should become sister cities, get a group of people of volunteers together, talk to Clara and Debbie and let's see if we can make that work. Because the one thing that we're not doing with our sister cities is just having them in name only. It's really important that we establish those relationships, um, that we have someone that's keeping that line of communication open so that it's more than just, it's, we want more than just being able to say, we have 20 sister cities. We want relationships, not just sisters in our city. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. I can't wait to finish going through the exhibit. Um, Mayor Barzma, thank you so much for your leadership here at the Historical Museum and the Historical Society Museum and everything that you do to keep this program going. And thank you all for being here this evening. say that uh, we have a, I'm going to be introducing Dick Marzano here in a moment, with John Meyer, who is also a partner. Oh, John, you've been you're doing a great job, and I worked with him when he was the director of the Boston Waterway Authority, which no longer exists, but at the time, a lot of lot needs to be done to bring that to the Boston Waterway. So we have Pat O'Malley, by the way, Pat was another port port minister, and I have a confession, confession here that he and I were involved in a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> we conspired. He and I, and Council Member Bob Evans was involved as council to make to convince the Department of Energy not to select the Port of Tacoma's entry of the world's nuclear waste. And uh, we, we put together a heck of a program and uh, convinced that department uh, to not uh, go forward. And so through our efforts, it was, it was one of the more successful efforts, and it was through his true leadership and late Bob Evans that we made that happen. Also, Mayor Eversall is here, Mayor Brian Eversall, who is very active in the <laughs> I had the honor of serving with uh, Mayor Eversall when he was elected mayor, and uh, it was a, a very eventful time that we had together. Tacoma became an all-American city during that time, and we also agreed to build the, world, the largest telecommunication, municipally owned telecommunication system in North America, the Cliff Network. It was all during his term my service with him. It was really quite an eventful time. Well, uh, it's my honor now to, uh, Joe Stortini. Joe Stortini, um, <laughs> logger up, terrific athlete at the College of Fusion South, not to be a fraternity brother of mine, but also was a great county executive and served in the legislature with distinction and has given, and after leaving public service, has given back so much to the community, so much to the community. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Marzano Dick is president of the Port Commission, and uh, he's a, a native and long-term uh, Pierce County resident. Uh, he's been a total longshore worker for 52 years. He served as president of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 23, one of my favorite unions, great group of men and women in that, uh, in that union. Uh, also on the executive committee of the Pierce County Regional Council, he was past president of the Washington uh, Public Ports Association. The uh, first time I met Dick, uh, we were kind of anxiously waiting to be interviewed. And we were both running for office. And uh, so here we have this 
longshore worker, coat and tie, glasses with a briefcase. <laughs> and I walked over and I said to Dick, you look more like a college professor than a longshore worker. We laughed about that. And by the way, we were both successful in our political efforts at that time. It's been, it was really an honor to serve with Dick uh, when I was mayor and he was port commissioner. Uh, his heart and soul is in public service and for the public good. It's my honor to uh, introduce him to say a few words on behalf of By the way, we also, the port has been a big supporter of the Film Historical Society, by the way. A big supporter, which we really appreciate. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Bill, for those kind words. Appreciate it. Uh, you had mentioned Claire and John who, uh, and, and Pat, who we, who I was fortunate enough to serve on. So if you guys get an opportunity tonight, you may want to ask Claire and Pat about us being up in a tree one time. And I mean literally up in a tree like 50 feet. And then you can ask Don about his trip to Vladivostok and how he tried to get out of there during a time that it took a lot of effort. Uh, you know, when I came in here and I looked at that wall back there, I wanted, and I said how uh, great that was, because it shows the history of Kitikushu and how the city along with the port worked. And I looked at three different dates. And July 5th of 84 is when the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Kitikushu signed a port sister agreement. Uh, in 89, uh, Claire, uh, Connie Bacon and Ted Bodiger then went to Kitikushu uh, to present the totem pole, which K-Line helped ship over there for their uh, centennial. And then in 2011, we had officials from Kitikushu, from the port, along with 25 other businessmen who came and women who came here. And not only did they, I know they uh, had meetings with the city, but they also had meetings with the port where we signed an MOU with regards to environment and disaster readiness and how we can work together. And it just shows how small our world really is. And the exchange programs we've had with uh, workers from Kitikushu that would come here and some of our work people would go to Kitikushu so we could exchange different ideas and thoughts. It's a, it's a relationship that's been built over years and has fostered a, a lot of results and it's something we're very proud of at the port. And I want to thank the, uh, the Historical Society for all that you do on behalf of the port because it, it is something we should always cherish. Never forget your history because it will be hard to do your future with that. But it's a pleasure being here and I can't wait to get back and look at some more things. So thank you all. Well, thank you, Jake. Uh, I just want to say that first I've got to say a few words about the Tacoma Historical Society. Uh, Claire Petrich, by the way, was one time president of the board, and uh, we have several of our uh, members of our, of our board here tonight, and former members. Um, we are the keepers of Tacoma's history, and behind that wall, that blue wall on the other side of uh, where, the, where all of the, the signage is and such, is about 2,000 square feet you haven't seen. And in that space is our archival collection, over 20,000 items we have in that space. And there's a whole host of things that you know, uh, 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 paintings, photographs, letters, books, you name it. It's your history. You're part of Tacoma. And so we cherish that and, uh, very much. And we keep that. We have a, a, a full, not a full-time, but a part-time curator who's not doing a wonderful job in sorting out and making sure that that information is available to researchers. And you can actually check out on, on the internet. But please do check out uh, the Coma Historical Society and see what we have uh, to share in our program that we have. We're, uh, we're virtually, this is one of the uh, first non-virtual programs, and we're pleased to have everybody here <laughs> in that regard. I have a real affinity with Japan. I've been there five times, myself personally. I've been to Kitakyushu twice, uh, and uh, also Kakura was essentially our first sister city, and then Kakura joined with four other Japanese cities to become Kitakyushu. It's got quite a record of environmental cleanup, by the way. Uh, much like Commencement Bay, their bay, bay was in terrible condition. That was one of the most polluted bays in Japan. Commencement Bay was one of the most polluted bays in the United States. And we took action to clean up our bay, bay and to bring it back to its natural state as best we can, and they did as well. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of commonality in terms of sustainability with the Kitikyushu. Uh, I also been to Hachinohe, and uh, Tokyo, of course, was a big event for me because that's where my son married Suzuka, 
and uh, she's Japanese natural, uh, national, my daughter, and they're in Chicago, and I have two great grandsons who are Japanese American. And I asked them once, I said, uh, I asked Miles and Brandon, I said, do you, do you dream in Japanese or English? <laughs> I said, uh, Grandpa, we, we dream in Japanese. They're fluent in both languages. So I'm, I'm very proud of them there. In, uh, in their activity. Now, as a as a uh, city council member and as mayor, of course, I was a great supporter of sister cities. And uh, I do remember that another stadium graduate who became mayor, the only other one, Big John Anderson, back in 1956, went back to the White House to meet with President Eisenhower. He felt that we could improve our international relations person to person, best. Not government to government, but person to person. And so he called 40 mayors to the White House, Big John being one. And Big John was thinking, now, how can I, who can I, who can I um, identify who has the strength, the will, and the can-do spirit, who's articulate, and doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't take no for an answer. And, uh, and I think, you know, when Big John was thinking that, of course, what comes to my mind, Bay Blair, who you know, Don Lucian, and of course, Sylvia Sass. Mm -hmm. I consider those kind of, those are kind of the big three of uh, the, the women leaders, uh, and community leaders that, that I worked with over the years. Now, um, of course, uh, Sylvia has been honored and recognized at the highest level by the emperor of Japan, by the way, and uh, she said, and there's a great comment, and she said, you know, here's this farm girl from South Dakota <laughs> who worked in potato, potato fields and, and uh, had a very tough time dealing with poverty and working my way up in business and so on, and finally being recognized by the emperor of Japan. That's quite something. Now, it turns out that the Tacoma Historical Society has made an effort over the years to recognize what we call history makers in Tacoma people who have made a difference, who really had an impact on our community over the years. And we've done so through what we call our Star of Destiny Award. And the Star of Destiny was the creation of Alan C. Mason, who was the greatest promoter of Tacoma in our history. And his, his idea was to make sure everyone found out about Tacoma through the Star of Destiny. And at each point of the star, there's a little characteristic of Tacoma. You see, he actually spent over $50,000 to which is a lot of money back to the turn of the last century, by the way, in the 1890s, around the turn of the century, to make people know, let people know about Tacoma, uh, the second terminus of the Intercontinental Railroad. And so we have a Star Destiny Award that we have. We honor some of the past recipients that you know, include uh, Norm Dix and Claire Petrich and Laurie Jenkins and Kenny Still. And Stan Nakarado, and Jim Walton, and Dolores Silas, and Pat McCarthy, Karen Vial, and, and a number of others. All have had this, this, this commitment. So tonight we want to add one other person to that list of Star of Destiny recipients to, to join in this, in this. And it's with a great deal of pleasure that tonight the Film Historical Society is recognizing Sylvia Sass with the Star of Destiny. Oh. This, is, this is the Star of Destiny Award from the Historical Society, the honored recipient of Sylvia Sass 2021 for contributing to international goodwill and understanding through the creation of the Tacoma's Sister City Program. Thank you. And we're, what we're going to do is put the, uh, we're, we're going to put this in part of our display, uh, and then when that's through, we will we'll give, take it to to you for your for your pleasure and your honor. So. Thank you, Sylvia. Now, uh, my next introduction. Okay, um, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a little more history here for a moment. I'd like to share a little history about uh, the relationship between Japan and, and, and uh, Tacoma as a timber town. 
as the lumber capital of the world. There is a relationship here that goes back many, many years. You might be interesting, interested to know that the first time a ship from Japan arrived in the port of Tacoma, it was the Isabella, it was a bark, sailing to Tacoma from Japan in August of 1885 with, listen to this, two million pounds of tea. It's the first Oriental or Asian cargo to appear on the customs house records in Washington State. So it was here. So that was our first contact with, uh, with Japan as a trading partner. It still remains to this day, from 1885 to this day, this very day, Japan remains as a, as a major trading partner with the, uh, uh, the city of Tacoma. Um, this book by uh, Ron Magnum, we have copies. Kurosato, Tacoma Pierce County Japanese, by Ron Magnum. You know, I always wanted a copy of the book, a little story about it. And so I checked Amazon, they had one copy for $250. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! There's only one copy left? Well, by the time I checked that out, uh, someone from the family walked in the door with a cardboard box with 25 copies for us. Oh. And they were selling them at the regular. And if you're a member of the Gilma Storkel site, by the way, I hope you become a member. I have some members, many of you are, for 25 bucks a year or more. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, become a member and you get actually a discount on the, on the book. This really is the story of the Japanese community in Tacoma and, and uh, Michael's going to talk a little more about Japantown, the robust Japantown we had in our city. Um, but, you know, the story of the Japanese, of course, goes back, goes back to 1885 and, and following. And uh, later, this little section, Tacoma's champion, Tacoma's really trying to get the Japanese to select this city and not the big city to the north, because they're council, right? This city, not the big city to the north. So there's a lot of competition going on. The Tacoma's chances of gaining the consulate increased with the steamship Fire Nang arri arrival in June of 1892 with the largest tea, silk, and curial shipment ever to enter the United States. And that was here in Tacoma in 1892. So there's a lot of history here, and Ron identifies all the great pioneers that were part of the Japanese community, and how they were able to withstand the anti-Asian sentiment that was rampant, that led to the expulsion of the Chinese in 1885, but the Japanese were able to stay here. But they went through a lot of, a lot of struggles to maintain themselves, and of course we know what happened in 1941. Let me finally say this, and you know, Michael's going to come up and talk about it um, in a minute, but let me just say that that uh, this is a, uh, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> crazy as it may seem. Uh, so, oh, well, I did not, it just came back to my head. <laughs> when you're, when you, the, the center of Japantown is about where the Murano Hotel is, and the convention center, pretty much the center of Japantown. And you'll see a sign that you kind of probably, it says the Harry P. Kane Promenade. Okay. And you'll wonder, what, who is Harry P. Kane? And, and why is this the Harry P. Kane Promenade? And why is it right in front of the Murano Hotel? Well, the Japanese community in Tacoma joined with me when I was mayor, and people who knew Harry P. Kane, including his daughter, to recognize him in some way, because Harry P. Kane, as the mayor of Tacoma, was one of two elected officials to speak out against the internment of the Japanese, one of two. And he also invited Eleanor Roosevelt into his office to meet with some students from the College of Puget Sound, Japanese American students. This was a few short days after Pearl Harbor. And they wanted to say to Eleanor that they were patriotic Americans. And please tell your husband that we're patriotic Americans. Please convey that to him. And all those students were rounded up and sent into internment camps. camps. I might know many years later, the University of Puget Sound granted them their degrees. I might say, good for UPS. So, Harry P. came from that when you see that sign, you'll know why it's there and why the Japanese community wanted the city of Tacoma to recognize that former mayor and what was the center of Japantown, the key part of Japantown. Okay, that's my, my shtick on uh, history. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce a true historian, someone who probably knows more about Northwest history than anyone I know. Uh, I had the great honor of being a guest in his class for many years when he taught Tacoma history at the University of Washington, Tacoma. 
and uh, listen to his talks. He's just a fantastic a font of knowledge and a great researcher and has, has a great series of stories on the internet about Tacoma as well as a part of keeping the Tacoma history alive. My honor to introduce you, Michael, Dr. Michael Sullivan. Thank you, Bill. Um, <laughs> it's always a bit daunting to be introduced to talk about history of Tacoma when Bill Barr's my opinion. <laughs> and, and you can't put too much weight on any particular fact or statement because there's a really good chance Bill already knows it and is going to use it before you. So anyway, uh, but thanks, Bill, and uh, it's been uh, really a pleasure to collaborate with you on many things over the years uh, when the city's history. Um, I kind of found out about doing this with the kind of short notice and I've been traveling and so I threw something together and um, as the program came into focus I find myself kind of editing down and trimming everything down really quickly. So I've got five or six pictures I'd like to be able to show, and if I can ask somebody to just hit the mouse and advance the pictures occasionally, <laughs> that would be great. Um, I guess maybe when you have your uh, celebration and your exhibit in a history museum, you're already inoculated, vaccinated for a historian that's going to come up and talk to you. So I'm not going to get too carried away. I'm going to kind of take a few capsules that hopefully uh, provide a little bit of backstory on the relationship between Japan and Tacoma and a little bit of fundamentals about um, the 120 years that uh, Tacoma and citizens of Tacoma have, uh, have a family tie to Japan. Uh, it's probably our oldest ancestor, our oldest genetic or legacy link in terms of uh, in terms of Asia. So, um, and I don't know how good these pictures are here, but I loved, I, I hate to start a story with a big map and be too big. It's always better to start with just an individual and to show you a face. Uh, Kiyoso uh, Matsumoto, um, the first sojourner he was known as. Uh, he came to America, you know, on a sailing ship, but, you know, after, not long after the California gold rush in the 1840s. Most of his life was lived in Tacoma. And what an adventurous life he lived as a scholar and a journalist and a diarist. Um, and uh, this guy is amazing. And his early history is just a wonderful, parade through the city of Tacoma and its relationship with Japan during the first 50 years of, of our history. Um, he finally made his way here and ended up still not fluent in English uh, in the 1880s. Um, remember, Tacoma was born with the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad, these steam locomotives, Abraham Lincoln's dream of being able to connect the Pacific Ocean with the rest of the country. And the northern version of the, the northern route of the Transcontinental Railroad, this this technological steam-powered uh, beast that sort of follows Lewis and Clark, ends up concluding its adventure at Commencement Bay. And the city's born, and that's us. Um, and immediately the idea is part of the wealth, part of the reasoning for building the Transcontinental Railroad is to connect with the Pacific Ocean and the ports of the Pacific Rim. So almost immediately, we've got sailing ships coming and going, meeting the trains. The rails meet the sails. And sailing ships are off to Japan and the Philippines and Hong Kong and uh, the rest of Asia. But Japan immediately becomes, a, becomes an important stop for us. Uh, as Bill said, for tea, um, a little bit later for silk in particular. Um, by the time Henry 
gets to you. He ends up working in the household of a man named Schultze, who happens to be the financial officer for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, so he's right in the belly of the beast in terms of seeing the power of the Transcontinental Railroad. And there he learns English. He learns to read and write. He meets his wife. Uh, he begins to work as a chef. Soon after that, uh, the railroad begins its great reach, and that is they take the technology of steam and convert it into transportation on water. And this begins the, the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, begin the age of steamships. Um, steam to get the locomotive here, and now steam to drive the ships. Um, and so uh, Henry is right there in the middle of the growth of the Northern Pacific Steamship Line, which the railroad begins to send ships two a week. One of them called the Tacoma, two ships a week, uh, coming and going from Yokohama, Japan to here. Now Henry's not from Yokohama, but he makes the trip back and forth in his lifetime probably five or six times across the Pacific and does it at least once by steamship out of Tacoma. Comes back, um, is there during the 1880s, and it, as Bill mentioned, the, the Northern Pacific Steamship Line starts in 1892. What Bill didn't mention is Tacoma won that contest, and in 1895, the Japanese consulate was built here in Tacoma, not in Seattle. Um, unfortunately, things changed. Seattle grew, we didn't, and the consulate ended up moving uh, eventually to Portland and then, and then on to Seattle. Um, but nevertheless, um, Henry leaves the household of Schultze. The Schultze house, he had two big mansions, one by the Rust Mansion and one on Yakima Avenue. On my blog, History Life, you can read the whole story of this guy. He's amazing uh, right up to the very end, which is very dramatic. Uh, and Henry is right in the middle of the final um, gunshot conclusion to that story. Um, Anyway, uh, Henry then leaves. Uh, he goes to the Klondike Gold Rush. I mean, the guy is chasing adventure. Uh, goes to the Klondike Gold Rush, starts a, a restaurant in, in Dawson, uh, makes a small fortune, and comes back and goes into business in Tacoma. And Michael, if we could just move ahead one. I wanted to just talk about how influential this age of the steamship lines are. We don't think about this today because radios and airplanes and all that stuff kind of blow out the, the great age of steamships. But this was a this was an amazingly romantic period where uh, these fabulous big ships would travel. You know, multiple classes on board ship and the first class on these ships across the Pacific were fabulous. I mean, it, it was elegance at a level we just don't even see in airplanes who travel today. Uh, all that going on. What, what kind of gets forgotten is that most of the uh, able-bodied seamen and the workers on the ships, um, uh, especially once the NP started to weaken and the OSK line, which was a major steamship line, the second largest in the, in the Pacific, uh, home ports in Tacoma. And that's when we really start to have an influx of seamen that are coming, traveling on the steamship line into Tacoma. It's also what fuels immigration to the city. By 1905, Tacoma, we're, we're at a point where there's probably somewhere around 1,500 families living here. Um, a big difference for the Japanese uh, community, Japanese families coming here are that uh, they travel back and forth like it's no big deal. I mean, it, admittedly, they're in steerage or first class or working their way back and forth. But Japanese families would travel like Henry did back and forth across. And oftentimes, a young man would come out here, get a grub stake, get a start, go back to Japan, get married, sometimes arranged, sometimes not. And then we'd come back, and they would have a family here. And unlike the Chinese that were contract laborers and almost all men, the Japanese quickly became families here. And that, that family relationship was how the neighborhoods developed and how the Japanese community grew. By 1920, and we'll jump ahead just a little bit and look at some pictures here in a second, but by 1920, 
the census was showing Japanese adults at around 1,700 when our population in the city was still only about 80,000. And our hotel rooms in downtown Tacoma, Japanese operated hotel rooms were over 2,000. So at any given day, Tacoma would have somewhere between five and 10,000 either Japanese, Japanese Americans, or um, Nisei, uh, American born Japanese, uh, American born citizens, American citizens of Japanese descent. So it made up a huge part of our population in general, five to 10% of the population. What made it amazing in Tacoma was the commercial and residential neighborhood, Nihonmachi, the Japanese neighborhood, was densely concentrated in one part of the city, which meant it had a major impact on the character of the city. Uh, and, the, and our Nihonmachi, our Japantown, was largely concentrated around our train station and around transportation. Because people arrive in by steam, they're coming by steamship, they're getting on a, a train, and they're going somewhere else if they're travelers, and vice versa if they're traveling to Japan from somewhere else. So let's go add just one more. So I want to give you a quick, a lot of you may have seen this <coughs> famous Ito map of Tacoma in 1920, but this is our entire downtown. Here's Union Station. Um, this is 11th Street where the bridge is. So everything from 11th Street all the way to uh, 19th, which runs into Union Station, and pretty much everything from A Street all the way up the hilltop, all the way above the market, almost to Tacoma Avenue, almost entirely Japanese uh, community. The families that ran the hotels lived in the hotels, but we had countless numbers of Japanese merchants and business people, doctors, photographers, apothecaries, school teachers, artists, you know, pick, pick a, uh, an endeavor. And those people were making a living in our city and shaping our downtown. But look at every one of these is a Japanese owned business in our downtown. Some blocks are completely full of just Japanese operated businesses, restaurants, hotels especially. And this doesn't even take into consideration all the Japanese single men that were working as cooks and working in the lumber camps or working out in some other industry or down in the mills and were just keeping a room in the downtown, eating their meals and staying in a room when they were in the city in one of the, one of the hotels. This is compared to any other city on the west coast and maybe any other city in America, the percentage of Japanese in Tacoma in 1920 was higher than any of them. We, we were, it was a huge factor in the way that, in the character of our city, any visitor to Tacoma getting off the train at Union Station would probably have their baggage carried by a red cap who was Japanese and lived in the neighborhood. Uh, if you were an adventurous traveler, even if you weren't, the safest, cleanest hotels tended to be the Japanese-operated ones. Some of the hotels that were down in the red light district and some of the rougher parts of town were a little spooky uh, <laughs> in those days, especially during Prohibition. But you were safe in Japantown, pretty much. Dash Hammond, the detective writer who writes about Tacoma a lot uh, in this sort of noirish kind of view, um, <laughs> concedes that, you know, this is the place, admittedly, it's a little bit exotic feeling, but it's not the place you're going to get an axe stuck in your head, like some writers were talking about. Um, he tended to characterize the Japanese as being the sort of reasoned ones in a, in a society and in a world where uh, situational ethics seem to be fluid all the time. And this was kind of the safe ground. So let's... Uh, just a quick look. One thing we completely forget about is the reason Market Street's called Market Street is that our public markets were equal in size to the Seattle public market. You go from um, 11th Street to 13th Street between Market and Broadway, that was all public sanitary markets in there. Um, and the lion's share of the green grocers and flower sellers were Japanese, were common Japanese. 
for the population we had here, most of the families had family ties with uh, agricultural relatives who were working in the fertile ground of the Fife Valley. And the entire Fife Valley, that, that was river bottom land, incredibly fertile land, and the Japanese were the most efficient there was at being able to get the maximum out of that soil. And so if you came, to, if you came over from Japan, you'd get a job with Uncle Henry working out in Fife while you learned English, went to the language school, got, your, got some kind of grounding, get enough money in your pocket, go back to Japan, get married, come back, maybe you work your way up and you become an insurance salesman in, in Japan. So that was the economy. It developed over a generation, then two generations. And by the 1920s, it's mostly Nisei. It's mostly uh, the, the, the business people, the people, the butchers you see behind the counter. Uh, these beautiful pictures where this is all beautiful white crisp tile. These these shops in Japantown were were wonderful. I mean they were they were they're what are copied today by um, by malls that want to give you a sense of you know high quality. Uh, that's what you that's what you found in the shops in, in Japantown and in the public markets. That's my that in mind. Another just look at and you guys, you all know, you've all been to Pikeplex Market, so you know what it's like. Uh, Columbus Public Markets were exactly that way. Sadly, of course, when internment comes after Pearl Harbor, uh, the markets all go empty and they get turned into housing for soldiers because of internment. Well, literally, it brought our public markets to our to needs because the production side was shut off by internment in Pike Valley. And the retail side was gone by the same episode, so the markets just went dark almost overnight. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to talk, I kind of just, this is a picture about kids. <laughs> just fabulous, and I actually brought along, you probably all know that we had a huge Japanese language school. Frederick Heath, the architect who designed Stadium High School, uh, designed the Palladian style Japanese language school it's up on Tacoma Avenue. And uh, these are part of a, a part of the library from the Japanese language school and these are illustrated children's books. There are over 120 boxes of uh, books and uh, please handle carefully obviously but um, they're lithographs. Most of this stuff is printed in Japan and then sent out here. And if you look carefully on the back of this beautiful little songbook with a hand printed or hand colored cover on it, you'll see a little stamp that uh, marks that it's from the uh, Nihon uh, Goshi, the Japanese language school library. So, um, these were saved with great help from Marie Morgan, by the way. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Let me go maybe one more photo. Just to, uh, oh, another one. Here's just boxes of the books and stuff. You know, um, I'm going to jump ahead and just, I, I want to just tell you one story that's slightly political, but it's, it's just, it's an episode in a story and a situation that we should all know as part of our history. I could jump ahead and talk about the uh, executive order and internment after Pearl Harbor and all that stuff. But in many ways, a much more um, revealing huge political fight played out in 1920 in Tacoma. Um, that was, it gave you a much better look at how Tacoma operated in terms of a, of a city that was that was a large part of its character was was Japanese so um, right after the First World War uh, there was as you probably know there was a lot of pressure uh, it's called the Red Scare period but there was a lot of uh, anti-foreigner activity in uh, in politics, both at the state level in Washington and at the federal level. The single most powerful person in America in terms of uh, integration policy 
was a man uh, named Albert Johnson, Congressman Albert Johnson, who eventually would write and pass the Reed Johnson Act, the Federal Johnson Act in 1924, that established the policy of using uh, quotas to determine immigration. And prior to that act for Japanese citizens, uh, immigration was fairly easy to do if you had a family tie. After the Reed Johnson Act passed in 1924, it largely excluded immigration from Asia. And it pretty well put a quota on immigration from <laughs> Southern European, Southern Eastern European cities. So it limited Greeks and Italians and Catholics and a whole bunch of people that were kind of excluded and, and limited in terms of immigration. Albert Johnson was our congressman in Washington State from our district. Uh, most powerful man in the country on policy. He was also a big follower of eugenics. So he had a real racial uh, fixation in terms of how immigration policy should work. And he was chums with our uh, governor at the time, Governor Hart, who was kind of of the same thinking. And so as a prototype to the Reed Johnson Act that completely changed American immigration policy at the federal level, he worked with the governor to begin to pass an alien land law in Washington in 1921 that basically was aimed at Japanese farmers and Japanese business people. And the law basically made it illegal for uh, non-citizens, read Japanese, to be able to own, rent, or lease property, meaning houses and shops in town and farmland outside. It also made it illegal for property that had been earned and, and in some cases built and farmed and cleared to be put in the name of minor children who were born in America and thereby citizens because some families were putting their family wealth, their legacy in the names of their minor children. The law made that illegal. It also made it a crime if you knew of anybody leasing, renting, or holding property in the name of Japanese or non-citizen, it was a crime not to report it to the authorities. So it criminalized that whole thing. So what it meant in Washington State, people like Miller Freeman and Bellevue and others who were advocates of this, it meant that way before Pearl Harbor, we were passing laws that hindered any kind of settlement, any kind of growth, economic, social, family growth, it really tied the hand. And we were ahead of California, which followed quickly in passing the same kinds of laws. And the Japanese were, of course, a big problem on the West Coast, so we were the leading states in terms of this. So you get the problem. And for Tacoma, it's a big deal, because this is our congressman, we don't want to insult him, it's our governor, blah, 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 blah. What happens is that um, the Japanese farmers in the Fife area begin to figure out that with the land that is out there, the other big landowner in the Fife Valley of agricultural land are allotments held by Puyallup tribal members. And what happens is that tribal land, which is granted by treaty, is owned and controlled entirely by members of the tribes. By the 1920s, Puyallup and native families, first of all, lost a lot of their kids to resident schools. We had a huge resident school here, and that's another one here in Puyallup. And so the children had been taken away from families. And during Prohibition, alcoholism took a horrible cost on young men and men within the Puyallup family. Most of the family decisions in the Puyallup tribe, maybe not most, but a good share of them were being, were being made by women members of the family. And they couldn't farm their own land because the kids weren't there and the parent and the adults were not shaped. Japanese families made agreements with Puyallup Indian women largely to be able to farm the land. 
And because it was federally granted land through Indian treaties, it was not subject to state and federal law about lease ownership. And they did the agreements on handshakes. So we have these great photos of harvest festivals with women in their kimonos, children running all over the place, and Indian families in their blankets and their full dress celebrating harvest together in the Fife Valley. And people like Frank Baker, business owners in the downtown of Tacoma, refused to adhere to the law, and they, on handshakes, they allowed the merchants to continue to operate, including in the public markets. Tacoma is one of the only communities in Bellevue on the east side of Lake Washington, in Seattle, in Bellingham, and Portland, completely hamstrung the Japanese community. In Tacoma, we got around it, and Albert Johnson was our congressman, and we still found a way around it, and it was broadly accepted in our community. So it's a, it's a wonderful, revealing um, solution to a social justice problem that came out of nowhere and was recognized and resolved by a community that really cared about the Japanese community and the Japanese members of our, of our community. So anyway, I've taken way too long. Uh, maybe Michael, one more shot. If you want to just, do, just one quick, just a quick look at this is just a chart that shows the ownership and farmland. That's Albert Johnson. Um, here's the, the Congress, the National Congressional Committee on Immigration came from Washington D.C. and met in the in the Tacoma Federal Building here and brought in witnesses, Japanese witnesses, uh, under armed guard. Uh, they um, put them under arrest and forced them to testify. So it was a pretty creepy time. But we did, in the end, we got around it. So anyway. Sorry about the abrupt ending. That's sort of all I got for now. <laughs> we'll do another slide. Thank you. so honored 
to be invited by uh, Terry you know, about a week ago. Could you come and tell us about uh, how, how, what brought you here in the United States? And as I said, I was born and raised in, not like Kita Kyushu, sorry, but born in Tokyo, <laughs> Tokyo, <laughs> Japan. I'm sent to uh, the Tokyo, Japan. Uh, why I'm here is I have to talk about my father and the story that I've been listening. Oh, my father must be in there. He first came, as, uh, he was born in 1902, and about when he was 18 year, uh, 16 years old, he first arrived, and he came here to chasing her, his uh, father, as a farmer and working, and I think he was working one of the uh, Furuya Shoten, that the old uh, grocery store at the time when he was 16, 18, like that. And then eventually he was graduated from UW and then uh, majoring the drama, so he went to the Broadway and um, uh, appeared on the movie. And it's uh, pretty, pretty good uh, things, that's why. He met my mother, and then I, so I was born, and my brother and sister were born in Japan, Tokyo. But uh, the reason why I'm here is the, for that reason that my parents, uh, my, my, my father is from this uh, UW, uh, graduated from UW, and then his English was so nice, not like my English. <laughs> and uh, he, he started teaching English conversation on the radio in 1946. February for 10 years, an NHK radio program. And come, come everybody, that's the program that he's been teaching. And so that, that will be dramatized from this November in Japanese um, uh, drama, 15 minutes every morning. It's very popular in Japan. But So that's how you know, my family is all really related, something about English. But when I was a little kid, of course, I don't know. I mean, he started teaching English to many people, but I was only you know, a little child. And uh, I, have my, I have my name, Mariko, as well as Mary. All my family has English names. And then they're all doing uh, a lot of things. But um, when I was 19, my eldest brother, Victor, Victor Hirakawa, he was in here. And so, OK, I want to come and brush up my English, can I? And I stayed with him, with our little, uh, his son, my niece and nephew. They are now 50 something, but uh, <laughs> I talked to him for four years old, two years old. And that's how I brushed, I brushed up my English. And eventually, you know, and I also went to Seattle, uh, Seattle Central College, at the time Seattle Community College. That's where my father was also graduated. It used to be Broadway, Broadway High School. And then that's how the, my Seattle Tacoma is our uh, second hometown. And the why I'm re here is to, is as, as you see that I'm wearing kimono, I'm teaching Japanese music and dance and in English in here. I would rather teach in here than in Japan because uh, this is my second, uh, our family's second hometown. That's why I, I'm here and then bridging between Japan and American culture. And that's what my, uh, really, the one I wanted to do that. I'm really happy. I wish I could perform dancing. I brought this fan, but uh, no time to <laughs> mix <Next> time. Also, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the today, well, Terry said that. Well, Mary, what, what uh, what's the difference between the Japanese culture and the United States? And I was thinking because of that, my father and my mother they married in Los Angeles, and more like American style. So our family. It's going to really more, a little bit more Americanized one, but still we sat on the floor and the tatami mat mm -hmm. and then Japanese style. And we always say itadakimasu and we're eating some food until daddy is re ready, don't start eating. And my dad says itadakimasu, itadakimasu. Or those Japanese culture that we always keep, uh, and that's a very important custom that we have to follow. And of course, we never worn uh, sh shoes in the house. And uh, it's always on, on the tatami mat. And all these culture, this, uh, the traditional Japanese culture. But that was, ni I was born 1945, so you know how old I am, 75 years old. <laughs> and, uh, about 75 years ago. Yeah, that's the way. But the lifestyle is getting more modernized. And then I was thinking, as Terry said, 
what, what is the definition in other Japanese culture, in the University of Japanese culture and American culture, and then in my family, as I said, it's more American style, but I'm, 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 I'm like, a, I'm actually a traditional Japanese dancer and music, musicians and teaching, and then uh, I established Kabuki Academy teaching Japanese performing art. So I'm teaching Japanese culture in the United States, so, and then that's why, that's my life work that I'm doing. That's why I'm very much interested in Japanese culture as well as American, of course, our culture. Uh, but I performed all, all over in the United States in sharing Japanese traditional culture, and I learned a lot of things from elementary school children, high school children. I visited about 200 uh, elementary school, high school, colleges to share Japanese traditional performing art. And I learned a lot. Of course, they learned a lot from me about the Japanese culture. And what I noticed was Japanese people are very shy and uh, it's always two, two step backwards and then uh, you need to eye like that way and then uh, they're quiet. While the American, even the little uh, elementary school kids, they're raising hand, asking some <laughs> questions, very aggressive and they're very kind folk. So that has a Japanese, uh, uh, even the children or adults have got the different culture. And then I noticed little by little, oh, Japanese people do this, no, but no, American people, they don't do that. And that's what I was uh, uh, thinking. And, and uh, I got, well, you, of, of course, you already know that when you eat uh, your noodle. No. You know, <laughs> you're eating, but we have to slurp. <laughs> that, way, that kind of a thing, but the, in a culture way, it's, it's very table manner that you have that one, and a Japanese style one, a little bit different. If, and you know, can you use chopsticks, hashi? <laughs> yeah, that's how we eat rice, rice ball, always holding this way, and a eat that way. And oh, I'm already full. You want some, some of those? Give it to somebody, and somebody put, put the chopsticks, that my, my mother said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but the chopsticks to chopsticks is very uh, worse manner in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of things that we learn by, from our parents, the table manner in Japan is very, so that's what I'm, I'm teaching Japanese culture and language in the Tacoma Community College in Seattle uh, ICC too. And that's how I'm teaching the table manners or traditional Japanese style. This is good, but this is not. And that's why uh, many, many American culture and in a different way, which I learned both in good way and I learned a lot of things. When I went back to Japan, I also, I used to teach English in Japan and come here and teaching Japanese to American. So sometimes 